Good afternoon and welcome to Facebook Live. This is Dr. Bert, Bill Bird, Chief Medical Officer at CGH Medical Center. Thanks for joining me on February 10th, 2022. Um, didn't do my usual pre-broadcast uh, pre check to make sure I don't have any uh, broccoli in my teeth, so hopefully I, I don't. Matt will let me know if I do. All right, let's. We're gonna today. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go through our usual visuals and give you uh, some updates as far as we're doing with pandemic-related items, and then do some shout-outs, answer any questions that you have, and let you go. So, without further ado, let's get at it. Matt, I'm gonna have you show our visuals. There we go. Uh, Seven thirty-eight. Still a lot of cases, but heck of a lot better than we've been seeing. So I'm, I'm happy with that. Any more numbers that you have there, Matt? Okay, good. Yeah, I like those downward trends for cases and uh, deaths. All right, good. Oh, yeah. Downward trends, liking those. Those are all good. Thank you, Matt. So yesterday, the Illinois Department of Public Health's usual daily update that I get from the Illinois Hospital Association are the hospitalized, hospitalized people in the state of Illinois are down to 2496. They were at, up at a high of 7380. So what would that be? Gosh, almost 5,000 more than that um, only a, a month or so ago. So that's really encouraging. The hospitalized in the unit in the ICU patients are 449 and ventilated patients are 243 with the Across the state, the percent uh, positive rate at 6.5%, which is also making really nice improvement. Matter of fact, I uh, I, I happen to look at the uh, newspaper here in town today, and it, it, the governor's projecting only 500 people in the hospital here within the next, I think it was in the next couple of weeks. That's across the state, so that's just awesome. I'm really I'm really excited about that. Obviously, a piece of news is the this situation with the mask mandates. And uh, the governor, of course, came out yesterday and said after February 28th, the plan is to um, do away with make the mask do away with the mask mandate and make that optional for folks in in most public settings. Uh, that that wouldn't go for healthcare and obviously not on the schools. Um, that is still being um, that's still being kicked around between the state courts, school boards, parents, um, we all know this. So anyhow, that's that's working itself through in the schools. Um, but yeah, that's a, a, that's, a, that's a great thing that um, come February 28th, we're gonna um, be able to move in that direction. At CGH, our numbers are definitely better. Um, I think our one of our challenges right now is actually just that our, our rapid tests that we do when we admit patients are still on very short supply. Uh, and so that's, that's probably right to, as of today, probably our bigger, biggest challenge because we have some patients that we have to wait till we get the test that we send off to come back before we, before we can make them, you know, we may, we assume they're positive until we get the test back type of thing, just on the, trying to be safe about that, but we're, that's one of the challenges that we're just trying to work through. Um, for right now at the hospital, our visitor uh, visitor policy is gonna stay uh, as it is. Um, obviously we will, we continually reevaluate re that. And at some point in time, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful as continues, trends continue as they are, that that will change as well. But at the time being, uh, we will maintain the status quo. Obviously as a hospital, we tend, we, we do have, uh, walking through our doors, the most at risk and medically fragile people that we have in our communities. So we're, we're gonna continue our, our visitation policy and masking policy uh, as is for the time being. The other thing uh, for the hospital standpoint, just so you know, we did get some more monoclonal antibody, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, monoclonal antibody in, which is an, an infusion that we can give patients who are high risk, who do get COVID. So just keep that in mind. I, I have seen uh, that in the community, the oral medications that one made by Pfizer and one made, made by Merck are off and on available. I saw a thing yesterday that the one made by Merck starts with an M. I'm gonna butcher the name, so I'm not even gonna try it, uh, but it's a Mer Merck product. Uh, is available. I think it was a, a Walgreens, one of the, maybe Sterling. 
So at least for now, there's we're starting to get a, a stream of those type of things coming in as well. Granted, the cases and the number of people that are getting it are going down, which is I'm much more happy about that than that we've had a slow getting these medicines uh, available. So for the people that are still getting sick, great. I wish we had those medicines sooner, but we have what we have when we have it. Yeah, and I was as I was saying earlier, um, I, my, I have my, my fingers are crossed, but I am very encouraged with the current trends. Uh, I mentioned the hospitalization pro projections for the state of Illinois. I, I and I think all of you have learned that making hard, fast predictions during a pandemic involving a virus that mutates into different variants is not something that, that one should to, one should do. So I'm just saying I'm hopeful and the trends look good without telling <laughs> without saying to you that yep, this is how it's going to be. But I'm also encouraged, believe it or not, I'm actually encouraged by how well we as a as a society, as a community, as our communities are actually navigating this. I mean, it's been close to two years now that this pandemic has been going on. And obviously there are pockets where frustrations do boil over uh, that you see on the news or you hear about uh, locally and also state and nationally. But, but to be honest, I, I, I think in day-to-day -day life, I think most folks are doing a really good job of going about their lives and um, everybody, some people uh, feel more comfortable and less comfortable about, uh, you know, masks and those type of things in, in public settings. And I, um, I, I think I'm, I've been encouraged by when you think about it, how many folks are so stressed or so stressed is a little strong, but people are, you know, there's a lot of anxiety about going through a pandemic and, and all of us, this is something yeah, it's new to all of us. I don't think there are many people who are around now who were alive in 2000, excuse me, in 1918 or 19. So uh, it's a new thing and I think we're weathering it well. And I'm, I guess my other encouragement is that it looks like that, you know, we're going to be seeing the tail end, at least of this surge really soon. And so that's great news and uh, more life as normally should, should happen is, going to be able to happen. So yeah, that's, I think what I wanted to share about just some thoughts on the actual trends and everything with the, with the pandemic. So I did want to give some, oh, uh, is it early someone could get reinfected and possibly carries the virus to someone else? Good question. The, the number that we are, th that we are using is about 90 days. So how we do that is if someone's already had an infection, has, a, has an infection within 90 days, we don't retest them. We assume that they're um, immune. We assume that they're in good shape. After 90 days, then there's some more variability because some people after their infection mount a really robust and maintain a robust immune response and others not as much. And you really, you don't know that for sure just looking at someone. So 90 days, hard, fast. Yep. Pretty good. After that depends. Like for instance, this Omicron, Omicron variant, because of the different mutations that had occurred, it, even though you'd had a previous infection, you could still get Omicron. So some of that plays into all this as well. Thanks for the question though. Ah, take the masks off now. Yeah, I thought someone might ask that. <laughs> I, I, okay, I'm, I'm glad you asked it. Not glad. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, it's people are so anxious about all that, and I, I honestly can see both sides of this. I, you know, for the reality is for for a uh, for a student in a school, the students themselves are very low risk of getting really sick if they get uh, COVID, particularly with this Omicron variant, uh, and obviously there are some benefits to. Uh, what did I jot down about that? You know, more normal environment and seeing this part of your face is, is helpful, particularly for some kids who have learning disabilities and those kind of things. So there's no question that's a, a positive. And on the negative uh, side of that, though, is um, it's the, the, you know, the people, the masking part at schools is really not, I know this sounds weird, but it's not so much about the kids. It's about the unvaccinated at-risk adults that those kids are around um, because the reality is though, though the unvaccinated at risk people and keep in mind that risk 
includes that includes folks who are overweight or, or, or obese, which is close to 50% of the population that, you know, and the grandmas and grandpas and those kind of things there, that's the benefit until we get a little further down in terms of uh, the number of cases that having someone wear a mask can be helpful for. And, um, and then for students who do get um, an infection, then they're out of school for a little while. So wearing a mask, there's no question wearing a mask does re reduce your risk of getting an infection. So I guess I, where I'm, I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit and say, I, I tend to fall more in the camp of just a little bit longer with the masks, but I can, but I do understand how now there's more of a conversation about that. Hope that answered your question. Um, will a fourth shot be recommended? Yeah. So right now, fourth shot, definitely patients who have significant immunocompromised situations are, we're doing those. Uh, for other than that though, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, you know, it's going to be some question about it. Boy, I sure hope this is it in terms of variants. Um, but if we have other variants and we have other little surges and those type of things, I think we're going to have to think about in the scientific community. It's going to have to think about whether it makes sense to have more boosters. And of course, you've heard about a combined flu and COVID booster. That may be a possibility in the future. I just think it's a little too early to predict on all that. What shot's the safest, Marilyn's asking. Yeah, so I would say that in terms of being safe and effective, either Moderna or Moderna or Pfizer would be my vote. I got a Pfizer just because it was available first. The only thing I would say on the Moderna one is if you're an, uh, like an adolescent to 20-something-year-old male, I think I'd probably get the Pfizer. Because of there's, it's not that high, but there definitely are a higher percentage in that group of of, of folks with uh, some of this some of this heart inflammation called myocarditis. But other than that, I think both both vaccines are both very effective and very safe. And and we've said this before, but yeah, the when you when you weigh the pros and the cons, um, even the worst side effect or concern about a vaccine is uh, in the in the scope of things way safer than just waiting to get an infection. What was the, what was the next question? Okay. It depends. Um, usually the cold symptoms, I would say fairly quickly, but I was talking to someone yesterday. It just depends. I, I was talking to someone yesterday that works here at the hospital that I, I know that I, you know, just checking up and I knew that they had had COVID a while back. And um, she was mentioning that she still, since COVID, will have a hearing kind of come and go uh, for, you know, well, just not long, but if, and every day or two, all of a sudden, her left ear, she won't hear as well. Um, and the kind of the fogginess of, um, in terms of thought, has improved a lot, but that was a lot, that took a long time. So it just is variable in terms of how long folks have symptoms afterwards. Okay, so appreciate all those questions. I wanted to give some shout outs. So I've, the first shout out that I want to give, as I do, the, I do about a quarterly shout out to Danielle Baker and the pain clinic. So Danielle, shout out to you. Thank you for viewing and watching all the time. Uh, she tells me she's my most, most faithful um, uh, nurse viewer here at the hospital. So I'll trust her on that and thank her for, for uh, tuning in. So thanks, Danielle. I also want to give a shout out to our marketing team. I don't do that enough. Uh, they are phenomenal and they do a great job of teeing this broadcast up to make it uh, go as well as it does. And so that would be Matt Lindstrom, Rebecca Green, Liz Foster, uh, Dana McCoy. So to all of you that do the pre-show and get things set up for, for this show to happen and afterwards, thank you so much. We do have an employee of the month. It's the beginning of the, fairly towards the beginning of the month. I wanted to highlight Ken Masters. Ken is a delivery driver in materials management. So shout out to Ken and the, and the good work that he does here at CGH. So thanks to Ken. And I wanted to give another shout out that I, I also don't think I do enough, but 
you know, we've been at this now for, like I said, close to two years. And I, I want to thank those of you who um, are faithful viewers who have been tuning in um, either all the time or a lot of the time uh, throughout the course of this pandemic. I thank you. I appreciate all your encouragement um, throughout this process. Uh, yeah, I can't say that enough. And I do appreciate your questions and, and comments um, that have come out during the course of these broadcasts as well. That's a good thing. Good thing to ask questions, a good thing to have things that we talk about. So uh, unless there are other questions, I did want to, to highlight next week. And next week, we're actually going to be talking about, about heart health. I'm going to have Dr. Kiso, who's a cardiologist here at the hospital on, and we're going to talk some stuff about, about uh, hearts and heart disease is a big deal. As a matter of fact, it's the number one big deal in terms of things that ultimately causes um, folks demise here in our country. So yeah, we're going to talk to Dr. Kiso next week and I'll give you some more, I'll share some more updates about the pandemic and hopefully I'll continue to be able to share really encouraging ones. So until then, thanks for tuning in, really appreciate it and hope you have a great week. Thank you.